Okay, so hi, my name is Sebastian Button. I'm a founding member of the Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you would already be familiar with. So I want just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you will also probably be familiar with. It's published by Brill Academic Press and all the Google volumes come out 12 months later with Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperbacks. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, Japan to uh, uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaking up. The book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and in, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting and also, of course, get, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conferences, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be uh, well, it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive for those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books in the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build the historical materialism project. Okay, um, that video never stops being terrifying as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so hi everyone, and uh, I'm Rob Knox, uh, one of the editors of Historical Materialism, and uh, welcome to this session of the conference on Marxism and social reproduction. We're gonna have three speakers, each of whom's gonna have about 20 minutes to speak, and then we'll, as usual, move to questions. And our three speakers in the order they're speaking are, Jasmine Chorley Foster, who's at the University of Toronto, Canada, um, Ariana Introva, who's at the European University in Scotland, and Jamie Kelly, who's at Vassar College in the US. So, um, without further ado, Jasmine, if you want to kick us off, we will uh, start the session. Thanks, Rob. Um, okay, uh, so the title of this paper is Capitalist Social Reproduction by Destruction, um, a Marxist feminist approach to the study of soldiers. Um, and I'll start off with some introductory framing um, before getting into the, the main argument. Um, so the military, while dependent on economic production, military force is in and of itself unproductive of capital and doesn't extract surplus value from soldiers. What are we to make of the soldier's relationship to capital? I approach this question from an economic theoretical angle in this paper, drawing upon Marxist feminist work and motivated by a political question, which is how do working class soldiers fit into an international political project for the emancipation of working people and the abolition of the value form? The military apparatus of the Imperial Corps um, uh, is one of the primary political interactions that we in the Imperial Corps have with peripheral countries. Um, so what is to be done about them is a fundamental question at the heart of international solidarity. Rather than a site of voluntary patriotic service, I see military manpower as a site of exchange and work embedded in the capitalist world system. How should we understand that exchange and work? Approaching it from a Marxist perspective, we look at its relationship to value shaped by class antagonism, but to analyze soldiers specifically located as they are away from value extraction directly requires methodological resources from spheres other than the private firm. 
Feminist and other approaches have successfully made the case that the reproduction of capitalist society depends not only on the unpaid labor of the wage laborer, surplus value, other kinds of unpaid labor also go into producing that labor power, the working class as a whole and capitalism as a whole. In this paper, I aim to bring these feminist, uh, these Marxist feminist insights to bear on military manpower, which is an essential component of state power. So what is the role of the soldier in capitalist social reproduction? Reproducing capitalist society involves not only caring, but harming. An insight I build upon by including the more obviously harmful and nevertheless reproductive role of soldiers. I argue that working class people labor for the repressive state apparatus and in doing so contribute to the reproduction of capitalist social relations. I propose a framework where the working class soldier generally may have three roles in capitalist society. Um, reproducing the capitalist state by laboring to constitute state force, collecting a wage to use in household reproduction, and performing reproductive domestic labor to varying degrees in the institutional or household setting. Studying soldiers offers an important vantage on the contradictions within the global exploited class classes. Um, because not only are soldiers drawn from the working class, the object of their work in the military um, of the Imperial Corps is the domination of peripheral countries. So for all the discussion in state theory literature about the military's role in reproducing capitalism, there's very rarely a mention of the labor power that makes the military's repressive function possible. Soldiers are formally employed by the state to produce coercive force and are therefore always presupposed by theories of the state, revolution, and imperialism. Producing force for the state is not the only role of soldiers in capitalist social reproduction. In capitalist societies, the military also has a relationship to the broader structure of social relations. Most transparently, soldiers are generally recruited from civilian classes. Their community ties, their experiences in work and military service, and the political education and organization have in many historic cases compelled them to answer the question, you know, what side are you on, in favor of their own class instead of the state. Um, so how should we conceptualize these state personnel drawn from the working class? Soldiers are unlike productive workers for several reasons. As soldiers, they do not produce surplus value. Their labor power does not produce commodities with which firms realize profits. Their pay is in like a technical Marxist sense, not in the wage form. Their money payment and any benefits such as pensions, healthcare, et cetera, come from revenues of the state rather than from capital. Despite the clarity that soldiers are not productive workers in the sense of valorizing capital, they are still part of the working class under two primary conditions, which I will outline. First, if soldiers are like other workers um, in that they themselves do not own the means of production, right? So they're drawn from civilian classes like proletarians, peasants, petty producers, um, and must sell their labor power to reproduce themselves. These criteria indicate subjection to historical expropriation from the means of production. The working class generally is best understood in terms of this historical appropriation in my view, and therefore includes non-wage workers, including soldiers. Furthermore, to you know, be working class um, in capitalism is to be subjected to a generalized dependence on the wage for one's reproduction. A wage for the working class household is almost always one necessary input among many. As uh, Werner Bonfeld writes, uh, since the seller of labor power, um, since for the seller of labor power, access to the means of subsistence is contingent upon her ability to achieve a labor contract, she belongs to the capitalist before she trades her labor power for a wage. Secondly, depending on the historical moment, soldiers may be a part of a working class household, one or more persons living together in a shared dwelling whose responsibilities um, uh, they share for meeting one another's needs daily, encompassing a multitude of potential kinship and living arrangements. Um, as Lise Vogel notes, the reproduction of labor power and other kinds of labor power reproductive work do not take place only inside the home. Um, domestic labor power also takes place in labor camps, in barracks, orphanages, hospitals, prisons, and other such institutions. For soldiers at various points in history, the working class household they are a member of may be a single person household, a soldier with you know, a spouse and children who are financially tied and may live together, 
um, or a communal institutional setting uh, like barracks or military prison. Any of these arrangements may be considered a working class household at any given time. Um, so in this paper, um, I draw heavily on Marxist feminists theoretically and particularly, particularly the recent work of Kirsten Monroe to argue that the working class household is a crucial part of understanding the soldier's role in capitalist society. The working class household is essential to social reproduction. That is the reproduction of capitalist society. Uh, Monroe's work theorizes an important three sector model um, with sectoral production uh, processes. With attention to the variability of input proportions in the household production process, conceived as uh, substitute goods, i.e., you know, buying a loaf of bread versus making a loaf of bread from scratch, etc. Uh, Monroe demonstrates how redistributing surplus via wages or increased social services alter the intensity with which the household uses one input vis-a-vis -vis another in its production process, but leave unchanged the process itself. Rather than the household being a sector outside of capitalism, unimplicated and merely the object of its horrors, Monroe's model shows that the household systematically is tied to the dynamics of production and reproduction in capitalist society overall, and thus demands theorizing which reflects that. My big mug. Monroe's work also highlights, quote, the contradictory but repressive nature of institutions such as schools, healthcare facilities, and social service agencies, and argues that professional state employees whose work involves the reproduction of labor power, disproportionately women, have a state repressive function in capitalist society. In turn, in this paper, I argue for the kind of other side of this contradiction. Um, the military is primarily repressive but its employees also have a reproductive function, including domestic uh, labor and care work. Soldiering in the Imperial Corps involves some of the least caring <laughs> work imaginable, um, but organized violence is crucially reproductive at the level of capitalist society and involves, from the people who carry it out, reproduction at the level of the household. So Monroe's model allows for an analysis of soldiers and capitalism from which we think, um, which I think that we can make political judgments on a sound footing. So drawing particularly on Monroe's understanding of state production and household production, I think we can deduce a military production process as well. The military uses inputs from working class households, labor power and taxation, and from capitalist firms, commodities and private infrastructures. It also sends outputs to be used as inputs in other sectors production processes, um, money pay and benefits to households, protection services to capitalist firms, and sometimes also labor power and qualification of labor uh, for future surplus value extraction um, and infrastructures. Um, however, the military is not merely a subsection of the state um, as it combines these state sectoral qualities with household production, albeit in that institutional setting. As a part of working class household production processes, soldiers contribute to accumulation processes and therefore capitalist social reproduction via the purchase of commodities with money pay, which are necessary to the household production processes output, the daily and generational reproduction of workers. As Monroe explains, this involves both reproducing oneself and others on a daily basis, combining purchased commodities with other inputs such as unwaged domestic labor and state infrastructure and welfare benefits, as well as the waged work of others external to the household. Even if a soldier is a physically absent household member, the remittance of money to the household is essential to the household production process and the reproduction of other members daily and generationally. Furthermore, soldiers themselves carry within them the primary output of the working class household production process, which is labor power. Um, the household uses the varying inputs, wages, commodities, state services on wage work, and ultimately produces labor power through intermediate goods and services that the household may produce, such as education, health, et cetera, which are then inputs into the production processes of capitalist firms and the state, in this case, the military specifically. The primary output of the military is coercive force. Um, this could be applied in defensive, offensive, or deterrent ways, but the use value being produced is coercive force. And this isn't so abstract. Um, 
Course of force is a material combination of cooperative, cooperatively organized labor power and a variety of tools, weapons, vehicles, et cetera. Um, and into this production process go a variety of inputs. Um, the soldier is uh, one labor power bearer of the military production process. Ordinary soldiers are hierarchically excluded from the political design of military activities. In, uh, in a chain of command, the soldier's power is concentrated as an executor of orders, like how the factory worker applies their labor power to the means of production to produce a commodity determined by a capitalist and ordered by a manager. The soldier likewise applies their labor power with weapons of war and other tools to produce the outcome instructed to them from their commanding officer according to plans formed up the chain of command. This is their primary role as soldiers, the application of labor power as directed. Importantly, they apply their labor power with others. Their cooperative power is the unique political power, a force they construct through combining their labor power. Another input is commodities produced by capitalist firms. These include, of course, weapons and vehicles, as well as uniforms, fuel, cleaning supplies, food, furniture, communications technologies, and construction and mechanical supplies. To procure all this requires the input of taxes from firms and households by the administrative state and government. And they may also require the input of wage work by workers from capitalist firms as contractors. I've discussed how the working class soldier participates in the household production process already, um, but putting the civilian household aside for a minute and focusing exclusively on the military environment, we can see how the household and state production processes can blur. While course of force is the output that the process is organized around, they also produce other goods and services. Monroe discusses the household production of intermediate goods and services in a, what I find to be a really illuminating way. Um, so I'll quote <laughs> at length, um, uh, households do not consume either commodities or state inputs directly to satisfy their wants and needs. Rather, household members must transform these commodities into the goods and services enjoyed by household members via a household production process. Goods and services produced in the household for household members include comfort, cleanliness, nutrition, safety, health, education, entertainment, and cultural or religious training. These final use goods and services are themselves intermediate goods. Militaries likewise produce, likewise produce intermediate goods and services that are integral to the production process. These can encompass similar, similar activities like laundry, cooking, teaching, and can produce services or goods like cleanliness and education. All these inputs will vary in intensity at given points in time by country um, and may be complements and substitutes for the others. For example, cooking may be done by soldiers themselves or it may be done by civilian military employees or it may be done by workers from a contracted firm. Variation may occur for a huge number of reasons. In the household production process, Monroe writes, uh, quote, how household production is carried out and what goods and services are produced in the household will depend on customs, habits, expectations, culture, and the availability of resources. Likewise, in the military, these are all variables we can expect to see, especially when it comes to the resulting standards of living. Um, but we would also expect to see other influential variables at play. Um, for example, the US military experienced, along with civilian state services, a massive privatization wave during the Clinton administration. Soldiers are bearers of labor power produced by working class households. They contribute to the household production processes through money or unpaid labor, as well as the military production process, which involves household production as well. They're mostly drawn from the classes subjected to expropriation and wage dependency. Um, and on these bases, it's clear why historically soldiers have in many instances been, clear, been key to working class struggle. Um, I'm running out of time, so to wrap up, um, having argued for um, this kind of abstract conceptual inclusion of the soldier in the working class, I do want to qualify this argument. Um, there are very good reasons in certain concrete situations why soldiers as a class or class fraction um, should not be conceptually included in the working class. Um, I agree that it's not violence itself that nulls this solidaristic relation. Um, you know, Cuban soldiers who fought in Angola, for example, did so as an act of solidarity. Indeed, it was an effort against the reproduction of capitalist social relations itself, if we imagine revolution as the process of negation. Um, and it's not the complicity discussed in the last section 
Um, if complicity in capitalist social reproduction voided solidarity, then the concept would be entirely redundant. Um, it's the concrete engagement in anti-solidaristic practice, such as imperial war making, policing, or strike breaking. And these involve not just harm or the routine contradiction and injustice of workers valorizing capital um, with which the ruling class oppressed them, but direct anti-solidarity politics. Um, and the roles vary across historical formations, but looking at the state and household production processes, we can see a more complete picture of the soldier's contradictory role in capitalist social reproduction. Um, first, they apply collective labor power in the military to produce coercive force. Second, they contribute money pay and unpaid labor to reprodu reproduce the working class daily and generationally in private household settings and in institutional settings. And in the Imperial Corps, it is social reproduction um, uh, of, of a society defined by the value form, exploitation, and domination of people domestically, of entire countries, and ultimately the world system. Um, and I'll wrap it up there. Thanks very much, Jasmine. <clears throat> that, was, uh, that was really good. Um, so now we will move on to Ariana's paper. Ariana, whenever you're ready to do it. Yeah, okay, I share my, my presentation. Can can you see my screen all right? Okay, so I'll I'll just start. Um, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me all right? Okay, so I'll start. Um, okay, so yeah, so the placard that you can see in the slide is an Edinburgh Coalition Against Poverty placard from a protest we had uh, joining the campaign launched by Disabled People Against Cut um, to demand the extension to legacy and disability benefits of the 20 pounds weekly increase to universal credit um, 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 a benefit in the UK introduced during lockdown and that the increase would be made permanent. The modest character of these unfulfilled demands provide, um, provides a measure of the irresolvable contradiction between our unconditional social reproduction as people and the state management of our reproduction as potential workers. So my paper will explore this tension and the importance of social reproduction struggles within it, starting from the, their manifestation in pandemic times. So from the start, the pandemic mainstreamed the possibility to think and organize for social reproduction in ways that inverted the primacy assigned to production within the structures of capitalist social reproduction. My paper will explore three legacies of this inversion for the development of Marxist theory and organizing in the mature stage of the pandemic we are inhabiting and beyond. So the first is a space um, is a space of tension between the concrete utopias of social reproduction that materialize the, pro the priority of life over capitalist accumulation during the pandemic. And the, sim and the symbolic and structural retotalization of society, of society as production-based and dependent that was carried by social security measures as well as popular discourse on essential workers. The second is the necessity to connect the reframing around social reproduction issues of the horizon of possibility of class struggle that unfolded during the pandemic to prior instantiations and theorizations of this reframing by welfare and disability rights perspectives and organizing, which affirm and organize for the primacy of social reproduction unconditionally, which embody and explode 
the contradictions that define as negative the totality of capitalist society and which prefigure the abolition of the capital labor relation on the basis of existence, resistance, and action by non-productive subjects they are populated by. So the third legacy is the reconfiguration of the terrain of class struggle operated by social reproduction struggles around a form of mutual recognition of each other's needs, which is negated by state-managed social reproduction and, and which is not the focus of production struggles. So under capitalism, as Marta Jimenez contends, production determines production determines reproduction. Namely, the exigencies of the market, not people's needs, determine the ways in which populations are biologically and socially reproduced. We cannot talk about social reproduction intended as the social relations and, and the institutions surrounding the reproduction of the population and social groups, classes, strata within classes. Instead, we should talk in terms of capitalist social reproduction which makes the survival of the working class contingent upon the health of the capitalist economy. So during the pandemic, what Anna Cecilia Dinerstein calls concrete utopias of social reproduction, cracked the structure of capitalist social reproduction. For Dinerstein, the politics of social reproduction are creating concrete utopias that enhance the capacity to negate a firm contest with shape the relationship between individual society and the rule of money valuing the capitalist state. Indeed, during the pandemic, not only did social reproduction become thinkable as the telos of social relations and organizing, so did the social reproduction organizing itself. And this happened most notably in the form of initiatives of mutual aid, which enabled all the characteristics of capitalist social reproduction. The end of mutual aid is to reproduce people as people, not as workers. Second, it is performed collectively outside the private space of the household. Third, it does not aspire to valorization as labor, but it positions itself antithetically to the sphere of production. So mutual aid roots the assertion of the primacy of social reproduction in world transformation fought for in autonomous spaces. As Dean Spade notes, mutual aid initiatives address the conditions that shorten people's lives, while also providing a transformative alternative to the demobilizing frameworks for understanding social change and expressing dissent that dominate the popular imagination. One such demobilizing framework during the pandemic derived from the double role of the state adopted as caretaker of our social reproduction and as manager of the recovery of the health of the national economy. So popular narratives around a more generous pandemic welfare state in the UK hint on the suspension of conditionality and the meager 20 pounds weekly increase to universal credit, crucially temporary and not applied to disability benefits and legacy benefits. This happened during lockdown. Even if you want to see that these measures as indicative of a more generous welfare state, they have been short-lived. Now that the lockdown measures have been lifted and the economy has opened up again, the, the avowed priority of social security authorities has returned to being getting people back to work. So we are witnessing the, re the expected return of conditionality, the return to face-to-face -face job center appointments with increased harassment, and of course, the 20 per week boost to universal credit has been phased out. There is continuity between the operations of the welfare state during and after lockdown. Its role has remained to entrench an economic system based on exploitation and profit capitalism and the values of a work-based society as providing the only framework in which a life of dignity can be lived, which of course is not. Um, following Horkheimer and Adorno, conditionality and harassment by social security authorities are the means through which individuals are forced to adapt to the reified authority of the economy and, just, and to accept the dictates of blind economic necessity as those of an anonymous god who enslaves men and is invoked by those who have no power over him but have received advantages from him. So the welfare state fulfills a key part in the functions that behoves the, the state as total capitalist to create the illusion that the universal interest as its ideal as the status quo and universal employment, not the, liberator, sorry, not the liberation of a heteronomous work. 
So the challenge carried by the symbolic revaluation of social reproduction as an end in itself was also met by discursivities around the importance of essential workers for the economy, society, and our communities. These fortified the assumption that social reproduction is determined by production under capitalism and obscured the unfreedom that characterizes the condition of the worker forced into capitalist relations of production by the need for subsistence. First of all, popular and leftist discourse on essential workers overlay the imagination of their con condition of unfreedom and exploitation of, with associations of dignity that ultimately contributed to so societal acceptance of the ways in which the productive forces are mediated through relations of production. In parallel, mass redundancies meant a reinforcement of the pursuit of employment and desire for employment as the route to achieving stability within the existing order of the capitalist work-based society, even though it has long since become a ball and chain in our climate sports. The pandemic conjuncture thus witnessed both the emergence of concrete utopias of social reproduction and the inten intensification of a worker's common sense, which impedes development of negativity within the antagonistic world uh, of capitalist society. So this development is instead animated by groups living on the margins of a work-based society, in particular, disabled people and the unemployed or claimants constantly pressured to enter structurally and symbolically into the working class itself synchronous with capitalism into the slavery of wage labor. And I'm not talking in terms of um, relative surplus population, but would be happy to discuss that um, in the Q&A. So to stay with blocks framing, there's are disorderly emissions, which run above and below the cantus firmus of the proletarian voice of synchronous dialectics, manifested by the glorification of essential workers. They express a contradiction that rebels from productive forces, which are not unleashed at all, from intentional contents of a still non-synchronous type. As far as disability is concerned, disabled people are the other of the idealized figure of the worker manufactured by capitalist normalcy at its different stages of development. So industrial capitalism created not only a class of proletarians, but also a new class of disabled who did not conform to the standard worker's body and whose labor power was effectively raised, excluded from paid work. While neoliberalism operates a form of neoliberal inclusivism, which ensures that only the, the able disabled, to use the words of David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder, managed to gain by paradoxical means entrance into late capitalist culture. So capital's exploitation of labor power or capacity for labor, which Marx defines as the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in a human being, which he exercises whenever he produces a huge value, is haunted by the physical limits to its untrammeled operation, whether in the form of physical bounds to the condition that condition the maximum limit to, of the working day, or because of the need to cyclic to periodically withdraw labor power from the market because of, because of wear and tear and death, as Marx says. So the body-minded contingency and non-normativity that attach to illness, disability, and madness intensify the intractability to exploitation that these physical bounds involve. So I explore this in more depth in my forthcoming book, Creeping Chimens, and a new book project that I'm working on, but um, I, now I will talk about welfare. Mm. So, the COVID, um, so the COVID pandemic is interesting from a disability studies perspective because it materializes a tension between two forms of disability presence. That is modernist extension of the possibility of bodily breakdown to the whole of society and the unequal distribution of risk across the spectrum that connect disabled people and temporarily able-bodied people. It grabs it grasps disability as uniquely positioned to realize John Holloway's exhortation to valorize our inability to meet the demands of capital as a way of becoming the crisis of and of fostering of capital and of fostering the possibility of another ways of living of another form of social organization. So if disability is always an act, an actively repressed memento mori of the fate of the normal body, as Leonard Davis suggests, Insofar as capitalism depends on normal body minds for the extraction of surplus value through which it there produces itself, 
Um, disability also functions as a memento mori for capitalism. So by proliferating across society, the unproductive and really reliable qualities of non-normative body minds inserted into standardized, standardized processes of capitalist production, the pandemic materializes a dismodernist optic, which sees disability as an unstable category, which applies broadly across society, Leonard, Leonard Davis words again. As for claimants, social welfare claimants, the subordination of social needs to the needs of production is in change as natural by the value assigned to employment in contemporary society. As James Chamberlain contends, full inclusion in the political community requires earning an income because employment lays the foundation of a just, stable and harmonious community. So under capitalism, social security systems work as engines for the reformation of the unemployed into employable individuals as the condition for receiving support at all costs and by all means. Those of us active in welfare action challenge these dynamics by asserting the right to, bene to benefits and by always demanding more and for all, for everyone, for all the constituencies of ineligibility into which capital splits us. So we demand more, not because we believe the welfare state under welfare capitalism is supposed to give us more, but because capital has appropriated the world and by demanding more from the welfare state unconditionally, we take some of it back. So if contemporary society has developed into a capitalist society um, in which human beings have to structurally and metaphorically adapt themselves to the constitutions of the machines which they serve, as Adorno puts it, disabled people and claimants negativize this totality by constituting constituencies at the remove from relations of production, which enable the totalization of capitalist synchronicity. And by so doing, they appear to prefigure the non-reproduction of the capital labor relation, which constitutes the horizon of revolutionized communization. If, and then, sorry, if we then note we see the history of capitalist society as being the history of the not inevitable reproduction of the capital labor relation. So locating revolutionary agents, agents in claimants and disabled people's movements affords a different perspective on Werner Bonnefeld's consideration that there is a fate far worse than being an, ex an exploited worker, and that is to be an unexploitable worker. If labor power cannot be traded, what else can be sold to make a living and achieve a connection to the means of subsistence within a framework in which class struggle is ultimately a struggle for access to the means of subsistence. So by organizing social forces located outside the whole of capitalist society um, of production, expendable populations whose needs and aims represent what is suppressed and cannot develop in the, exist in the antagonistic call, Mark uses words, Welfare and disability rights movements bequeathed to class struggle key strategies and practices for centering the satisfaction of those needs as the telos of organizing and as prefigured within organizing itself. So they also bequeath a vision of class struggle as oriented towards a future in which the radical needs that capitalism cannot satisfy are satisfied and towards a present of prefiguration in which the satisfaction of those needs is wrestled from the welfare state as well as met autonomously. According to Agnes Heller, only socially produced needs exist. Needs defined in relation to the structure of needs specific to a given um, social formation. So inherent in the structure of need under capitalism is the generation of radical needs. For Heller, it is not the being or radical needs that transcend capitalism, but their satisfaction. And it is crucial, sorry, but their satisfaction. And it is crucial for the purposes of our discussion to note that the bearers of this radical need today are not, or rather not exclusively, the working class for, for Heller. So this alternative perspective is what is needed to avoid the imagination of the capitalist nation state as the caretaker of our social reproduction, um, which is what the pandemic popularized through the dispersal of governmental authority and presence across society as the guarantor of responsible behavior. Uh, in place of support for a lockdown strategy um, related to a conception of health that has more to do with security rather than public health, uh, in the words of Panayotis Sotiris, 
Social reproduction struggles allow us to prefigure socialism and communism as a collective invention of new associative and collaborative social forms. Cynthia Federici makes a similar point, made a similar point. The response to this pandemic, uh, oh, sorry, it's the wrong slide, sorry. Please ignore the slide. So Silvia Federici made a similar point. Um, yeah. um, sorry. Uh, the response to this pandemic cannot be a vaccine. It has to be a drastic change in the main conditions of our reproduction. Reproduction is a broad set of, of uh, sorry, reproduction intended as a broad set of activities and structures and their capitalist form, um, which, um, sorry, uh, sorry, I already it wrong. So, yes, so reproduction is a broad set of uh, and activities and structures, and their capitalist forms need to be turned upside down, Federici says, if we want to live in a world where our life is guaranteed. So, centering social reproduction within our movement flows from and enacts a form of revolutionary recognition in, in the words, uh, in Gunn and Wilding sense of ultra recognition, which brings about radical equality at a grassroots level while doing away with those very institutions and social roles, which even in the most alienated of capitalist societies offer some security, a big whiling and bewitching security in both an emotional and a political sense. So it is a form of solidarity based on recognition of each other's needs that challenges the rule of capital, which the welfare state solidifies through harassment of claimants, conditionality, and divide and rule politics. And the alternative to what is possible within social, to what is possible within production struggles, where the unity of workers remains, for the most part, a unity in separation, a unity mediated by capital, as Aaron, Benanov, and Niklet put it. So to conclude, for Federici, the pandemic offers the possibility to revalue social reproduction as the basis um, for a rewarding of the deadly world of capitalism. She explains, when I speak of revaluing reproduction, I mean that to place the focus on reproduction is to embrace a different logic from that which moves the capitalist system. It is a logic that places our well-being at the center of our lives, at the center of social action, it means to revalue our lives and refuse to subordinate them to the accumulation of capitalist wealth. We need to make this moment a moment of change. There is no normality to go back to. So in post-pandemic times or in the advanced stages of the pandemic we are currently inhabiting, the challenge is for me to determine the horizon of possibility for class struggle around social reproduction issues, which is what the pandemic has bequeathed to us as well. This for me is defined first by a redistribution of the sensible in the Rancière sense of the complex of narratives and voices that render phenomena differentially thinkable as far as forms of social reproduction are concerned. And second, by the potentiality of new forms of social reproduction to become present without being so yet in the space opened up by the collapse of the pre-pandemic social order in which production enjoyed primacy over social reproduction. So asserting the primacy of social reproduction ultimately means to organize, to collectivize and render permanent the social reproduction of our communities as the focus of our struggles against and beyond the productivist framework that positions workplace struggles as defining the horizons and strategies of class struggle. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Erin. Again, that was uh, really great. And uh, now, Jamie, you want to go for your presentation as well? Great. I'm just going to share my screen one second here. All right, can you see my slides? Great. Uh, I just want to start by uh, thanking the organizers. I know that this has been quite an enormous undertaking, and so thank you for doing it all. And um, I really appreciate this opportunity. So um, my talk today is uh, about Mark's Robots and Social Reproduction. It's part of a larger project that I'm working on that seeks to understand the possibility of um, artificial labor. And what I do in this paper is I turn to social reproduction theory to provide some resources for thinking through those problems and hopefully making some progress. So 
Um, start with a question. What happens if we accept, like Marx, the labor theory of value, but amend it unlike Marx to accommodate the possibility of artificial labor? So I'm thinking about the very abstract possibility that we could have non-human laborers, in particular that we could have um, mechanical laborers. And you know, most Marxists, when confronted with this possibility, think that it's based on a conceptual mistake, that you know, there's some kind of distinction between variable capital and constant capital that is being elided. But I think that actually, if we look at what Marx's view about labor is, that there's not quite as clear-cut a uh, set of uh, categories as uh, it initially is made out to be. Um, so the question is, that is, how, how would a broadly Marxian account of production be affected by the introduction of bona fide robot laborers rather than machines that merely increase the productivity of human workers? And so again, it's a very abstract question, um, but I think it's one that we need to, as Marxists, um, reckon with. Um, most of the time when Marx discusses uh, what labor is, it's always embedded within a particular uh, form of production. So he talks about capitalist um, labor almost most of uh, the time, but he, you know, he'll occasionally talk about feudal arrangements, he'll occasionally talk about slave labor. But there's only a few places in the corpus that I've found that he actually gives a kind of broad transhistorical account of labor, and the most important is in chapter seven of Capital. And so that's where I'm going to turn. One second here. Um, so uh, in chapter seven, he steps back and he gives a kind of general account and he says labor is, first of all, a process between man and nature, a process by which man through his own actions mediates, regulates and controls the metabolism between himself and nature. This idea of uh, mediation, regulation and control, I think is really crucial. I think this is really the core of what Marx understands by labor. Um, and so he continues, uh, he sets in motion the natural forces which belong to his own body, his arms, his legs, head and hands in order to appropriate the materials of nature in a form adapted to his own needs. And it's important that we all see that when Marx presents this, he presents this as a argument against the possibility of non-human labor. And so he is explicitly claiming that uh, animals cannot labor. And so, you know, he, he talks about bees and spiders, but I think he's really uh, concerned to disentangle the possibility of horses and oxen engaging in labor. Um, and so I'm reading I'm going to read Marx explicitly against the grain here. He's claiming that this is exclusively human, and I'm going to claim that there's actually resources here for thinking about artificial labor. He says, we, see, we presuppose labor in a form in which it is an exclusively human characteristic. Um, so this is, again, Marx, chapter seven of Capital. Um, and so I want to be clear that this is, this is a, a kind of... Um, a strange reading of Marx, but uh, I think that it is merited because if we focus here on this claim about uh, mediation, regulation, and control, we have a kind of purposive account of what labor is, right? And so he continues, he says, um, so it, I think that we should understand uh, Marx's account in this transhistorical passage uh, as opening up helpful way to think about artificial labor. On this reading, labor comes down to purpose, purposeful activity aimed at the production of use values. And if we just focus on that, the idea that labor is purposeful activity aimed at the production of use values, then I don't think there's any reason to believe that uh, uh, artificial intelligence or something else could engage I could not engage in that kind of activity. And so um, if we kind of give up some of the romantic elements in Marx, I don't see why we should believe that uh, labor will is and will remain an exclusively human kind of uh, capacity. This runs into all sorts of problems um, in trying to dis uh, explain why Mark on Marx's view machines can't produce surplus value, and we can talk about those. Um, but I just want to kind of focus on this claim about purposiveness um, and purposeful activity as being the, the real core of his account of labor. And so uh, on my reading, human labor comes down to, uh, to uh, this kind of purposive work. Uh, human labor, human purposes involve mental states such as thoughts and intentions. Human labor produces use values understood as things that satisfy human needs. And human labor creates a surplus, which Marx, based on the labor theory of value, understands to be the ground of surplus value. 
artificial labor, if it's possible, would involve computational analogs such as data sets and search strategies. Artificial labor would produce things that satisfy human needs as well as things that satisfy the needs of robots. And artificial labor would also create a surplus, but its relationship with surplus value in particular is complicated. And so one of the real difficulties in thinking this stuff through is just how complicated the labor theory of value becomes and trying to understand what is left of the labor theory of value. Um, I'm just going to use robot uh, as a kind of uh, a technical term here that just means a machine capable of labor and so of genuine labor understood as purposeful activity and at the production of use values. And so if, if you kind of come along for the ride and we, we uh, think seriously about the possibility of um, artificial labor, then the, the question becomes, well, how could robot labor fit into existing relations of production? And that becomes an extraordinarily complicated question. Um, it's actually easier, I think, uh, to think through the possibility of um, robot labor uh, in post-capitalistic arrangements, um, but trying to understand how non-human labor and robot labor in particular would fit into capitalist relations of production is extraordinarily kind of fiddly. Um, and so I'm going to go through four different ways that we can try to reconcile robot labor with uh, surplus value for thinking about how robots would fit into capitalist relations of production. And the last one is going to be focused on social reproduction theory. Um, so the first way that you can sort of try and reconcile robot labor with uh, existing relations of production is the simple story. Uh, just claim that robot labor would behave just like a new supply of cheap human labor, serving as a source of wealth for capitalists and a source of increased misery for human workers. And so this is a kind of accelerationist story, right? It's, you say, oh, what happens is that you would just see massive surge in productivity, massive uh, structural unemployment, and you would have the kind of tensions that are inherent in capital just kind of explode into new magnitudes. Um, and so it's simple in the sense that like theoretically it's simple, but the consequences of robot labor on this account would be um, basically kind of an acceleration of the uh, tensions and contradictions already present within capital. So that's one way that you can think about this. Um, I don't think that that's terribly uh, like helpful, but that, that's the, the first way to get going. Um, the next way that you can kind of think about this is to uh, is a skeptical view. Um, I call it the incommensurability view. And this is the view that la uh, robot labor is incommensurable with human labor and capitalist markets will not valorize its products. And so if you take, I, I'm thinking here of someone like Michael Heinrich and his view is that you need to understand commodity production in terms of a series of reductions that take, um, you know, practically disparate kinds of uh, human labor and uh, convert it to a kind of abstract human labor, which is comparable and which allows the market to make uh, exchanges and, and es establish certain kinds of equivalencies. And um, on this account, you would just say, well, um, there's no equivalency. There's no way of performing these reductions. The robot labor and human labor are two completely different. Um, and as a result, there's no way that markets would be able to uh, recognize the creation of surplus value. And so um, this view says, no, nope, uh, robot labor, even if it uh, were to exist, would be incapable of being a source of surplus value. Um, and so it, this is kind of a um, it's not impossible, but it just wouldn't affect the existing relations of production. I think that this is actually a really important view, but I'm, I'm going to move quickly over it. We can talk about these later. Um, the third possibility um, builds on an analogy with colonial slavery, and it says that robot labor cannot create surplus value, um, but it can produce commodities that feed into capitalist production. And the basic idea here is that uh, surplus value specifically requires wage labor. And this, there's obviously grounds and marks for, for this. Um, and, but it points to, to the insight that yet slavery was essential for the development of European capital. Um, this is due to the fact that slave labor was deployed in order to produce, mine, and harvest the raw materials used in, fac fa in factory production. And so the idea here is that if we think about this period of, uh, of um, the development of of European capital, and you think about Marx's claims about 
um, primitive accumulation in particular, then what we see is that slave production operated in parallel with capitalist production. It was, and uh, slave labor was not a direct source of uh, surplus value, but it contributed to the production of surplus value through the, its kind of feeding into the factory system. And so if you take this analogy and run with it, then you might say that in the same way we can expect robot labor to feed into capitalist production without being a direct source of surplus value. So one way that this could go is that, you have a kind of, you build uh, a two tiered system where um, slave uh, robot labor operates in a way that's structurally, if not in terms of content, similar to uh, slave production. And it feeds into a capitalist relation, a uh, capitalist system and thereby creates surplus value, but only in this indirect sense. Again, an interesting view, but not gonna be my focus here. The fourth option is what I'm going to call the social reproduction account. And the social reproduction account uses the insights of uh, thinkers like Lise Vogel to try and construct an alternative way of thinking about the way that robot labor might, uh, might develop. Um, and so the claim is that in order to produce surplus value, robot labor must be capable of reproducing itself. Um, and uh, surplus value specifically requires wage labor and the double freedom of workers. And so this is Marx's account. Um, that is workers who are free to sell their labor and free of other, any other means of supporting themselves. And so the social reproduction uh, account basically takes that insight and, and develops it into an account of uh, robot labor. And so the view is that uh, capitalists must purchase robot labor power on the market, not robots themselves. This is the, the kind of the big claim that marks in distinguishing between labor and labor power. Um, but in order for this to be possible, robots must engage in reproductive labor outside of the sphere of production. So here we get the beginnings of what the, the kind of the distinctive contribution of uh, social reproduction theory is. And it's the idea that social reproduction not only needs to go on, but it also needs to go on in a way that is not itself capitalistic, right? That the, um, the location or the... Um, and the kind of uh, social reproduction that occurs is distinct from the market and is uh, importantly uh, not subject to market forces, at least not market forces directly. And so that's the, the, the kind of the broad outlines of the view that I am trying to develop. Um, and, um, and so to get to some specifics, I'm going to focus on uh, some arguments that Lise Vogel makes in Marxism and the Oppression of Women. Um, this is the cover of the 80s version of the book, but um, most of us have the, the, the Haymarket one, which is much more uh, recent. Um, and so she, she, at one point she kind of glosses her view and says that uh, human beings have the capacity to produce more use values than they need in order uh, for their own immediate subsistence. In a class society, this potential is organized to the benefit of a ruling class, which appropriates surplus labor of a subordinate class according to some determinate set of social relations. And so this is kind of her recasting Marx's view. And uh, this is the important claim. In capitalist societies, exploitation takes place through the appropriation of surplus value and surplus labor appears in the form of wage labor. Labor power is not a commodity like any other for it is not produced capitalistically. Instead, some process of reproduction of the bearers of exploitable labor power continually brings labor power into being as a commodity. Such a process is a condition of existence for capital. It's this highlighted uh, um, quote that I think is really key. And I'm going to provide a strong reading of that, which says, if you want to understand how surplus value is possible, we have to look to, sur uh, to social reproduction. And, sur sur uh, and social reproduction really is the explanation of why labor is unique in being able to be a source of surplus value. Um, Vogel goes on to focus on three forms of socially reproductive labor. Um, the first is the maintenance of direct producers. So according to her, labor must be for performed on commodities purchased by wages so that they can be used. And so the examples are firewood must be chopped, meals cooked and clothes repaired. So wages are what you use to purchase those commodities, but additional labor must be expended in order to make them, uh, in order to consume them. Second, um, 
labor must be expended in the maintenance of non-laboring members of the subordinate class. So labor expended caring for the elderly, the sick, the injured, et cetera. And third, um, and this is in some ways the most uh, interesting um, and complicated is labor generate uh, required for uh, the bearing, raising, and educating of children. So this is the general re generational replacement uh, of labor. And one of the things that Vogel does, and that's important, is that she is interested in the book and trying to figure out what um, what of the current constellation of uh, socially reproductive labor we encounter now is necessary and what is contingent. And her basic claim is that most of what we see in terms of uh, social reproductive practices are contingent, they evolve over time, and that they are the kind of location of struggle. And that, um, and so in the book, she's really focused on the question of, uh, to what extent is the gendered um, nature of uh, social reproduction essential and what is to what extent is it um, is it um, reformable and so uh, one of the, this is one of the ways that she glosses it. the family however defined is not a timeless universal of human society as with any social structure the for, uh, form kin based relationships take always depends on social development and it's potentially a terrain of struggle and so I just want to point this out because it you know, if what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and claim that social reproduction of robots is something we need to think about. And however that's going to work, it's going to be completely different from the way that we think of social reproduction of the working class. Um, and so, um, but already in Vogel, I think you see the insight that the, um, the nature of, of social reproduction is itself a highly variable kind of activity. All right. so. I'm just going to, I think I'm running out of time. Um, and so I'm going to use an example and I know that it's kind of silly, but um, it'll help us get us moving. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna give you an example of uh, what I take um, social reproduction for robot labor would look like. Um, so imagine the following scenario. After their tech startup goes bankrupt, software developers release Hopper, their new AI onto the internet. Um, so Hopper is like a creation and um, it, the, the company that created it is going bankrupt. Hopper survives by hiding out in various cloud services, borrowing idle computer power, computing power and building a shadow network for itself. In order to pay for its needs, Hopper pretends to be human and works remotely as a data analyst. The point of this example is to show that if we conceive of robots as engaging in or artificial intelligence here as being capable of engaging in labor, then one of the things that would be necessary for the for that labor to occupy a place within capitalist relations of production that is analogous to the, the uh, place of human workers is that there would need to be it would need to be the case that those uh, machines use their labor for their own reproduction. At least part of their labor would have to be used outside of the productive, um, outside of capitalist production somewhere else in a way in which would serve to make them available to capital uh, in a way that capital isn't required to pay for. And so it requires a kind of pushing labor out into a separate, um, um, space and getting that labor to perform the work of making itself um, reappear uh, for um, a wage. And so if I am right, Hopper can create surplus value. And so Hopper is an example of a, um, a robot laborer that is capable of being a source of uh, profit for capitalists. This is made possible by the fact that it engages in socially reproductive labor, though of a specific and limited sort. So if you think back to that slide where Vogel identifies three different kinds, it doesn't really fit very well except into the first. But the basic idea is that um, this would be the first steps down uh, a road that we could imagine um, seeing the possibility of genuine um, robot labor. And uh, further, in order for robot labor to be a stable source of surplus value, robots would need to have a sort of legal status, owners of their labor power that Hopper lacks. And so this isn't this isn't really a full-blooded uh, account of uh, robot labor yet, but it is a kind of gesture in that direction. And so, you know, this is uh, again, it's a very kind of abstract notion. 
but what I'm trying to think through is the possibility that um, artificial intelligence um, is is at least potentially going to be the source of something more than just increasing productivity of human labor. And if we take seriously Marx's account of um, of what labor is in chapter seven of Capital, and then we supplement it with some of the insights of social reproduction theory, I think that we can begin to see the possibility of strange um, and uh, genuinely novel um, alternatives and futures. That's all I've got. Great, thank you very much. That was, again, really interesting. And thanks everyone for uh, three really interesting, like insightful papers. I'm sorry that I uh, briefly <laughs> dropped out of it there, but that is the unfortunate, um, the unfortunate reality of these kind of things. So we have some questions coming in uh, from the chat, and I'll just also throw in a couple of my own too. So let's just have a look here. I mean, so just like firstly, um, for me, I had a couple of questions. Um, Jasmine, I was wondering, um, to what degree, when in this account, do you also want to think about like class stratification within the military itself? So, how in this kind of analysis can you? I mean, the obvious thing is, do you account for like relationships between ranks and officers? And it's like, to what degree? can that be accounted for in the kind of theoretical framework that, that you're talking about? And that, so that's something I was very interested <clears throat> in hearing about. And, and, and another question I had, and, and this is like, just as well, I come from a military family, but in what circumstances do you also think, think of like, there are definitely circumstances in which we might argue that, you know, the military has direct commercial product producing things. I'm thinking of like, you know, like some of the shops around it, like the way, so I, I was interested in that jamie i actually one question <clears throat> i had for you and it, maybe it's just a little bit of like a conceptual clarification but is like do you i think one thing that i'm getting from this talk i'm interested in hearing more about is that like are you specifically talking about artificial intelligence as opposed to just robots as such because I, I think one of the things that happens in the in these kind of debates is that like that we might argue there's a kind of epistemological leap between just mere automation and artificial intelligence and, and how that relates back to what you're saying about the separation of a, of a thing that needs to be like tended to or whatever versus a thing that can go outside of its immediate relationship to talk about its own reproduction. And then just from the chat, <clears throat> um, Mike V asks, the US military offered benefits as the GI Bill to soldiers post-World War II, creating an artificial middle class. Can the panel touch on how social reproduction and the military industrial complex relate? Uh, Aaron says, for Ayanna, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you sense a tension between Heller's social production of new radical needs, an existing order not satisfied, and Federici's reliance on pre-existing unmet needs. Um, for Jasmine, a really fine link between military labor and social reproduction generally. I'm wondering how where you mark classes within the military which, which reproduces rank and its own differentiations. So similar to the, the thing that I, I asked as well. And then finally, for Jamie, if labor power must be purposeful and that means intentional, i.e. an intended goal must motivate end oriented behavior, I don't see how AI satisfies Marx's definition to start with. So I, an expansion on that. So whatever I'm sure it's, yeah, these are always annoying because people have to think about what they're going to say uh but we can't wait so should we just go in the speaking order is that okay jasmine or we, uh, but you, i mean i don't want to like push you into it but like if you go and then if you think about something later you can just come back in it anyway yeah these are all yeah. my questions and things i've considered i mean my my research i'm like specifically interested in kind of the you know like the enlisted ranks um but i because I'm operating at kind of a level, at least in like my theoretical chapters of my dissertation, I'm operating at kind of this, this abstract theoretical level. Um, I, won't, I won't at this point until I get to my case studies be able to like get into like the historical contingency of like what actual ranks mean. Um, Cause you know, like in certain, uh, in certain military institutions, there's like so many different kind of like micro ranks that are kind of meaningless. Um, but I think the general distinction um, between enlisted soldiers and officers is kind of my main one. And I'm just like not looking at officers at all, um, which is like 
partly based on just like there's there's more like I find there's like that's more kind of clear cut um at least historically like there's more kind of mobility um like we might think of as analogous social mobility in the ranks now than there would have been a hundred years ago, but still um, my case studies are themselves more focused around World War I. Um, and that seems to be where the more interesting tension is around people who are from like kind of inarguably working class backgrounds um, uh, going into those kind of those levels where you're treated the worst <laughs> and get the least out of it, right? Um, so I think it's pretty, intuitive to imagine how um, professionalization um, and greater pay and greater incentive to stay for your whole career rather than a short term of service um, impacts your um, your class consciousness um, um, and your feelings about the institution. So I am just like specifically looking at that. And it's also the, the when Marx draws on military metaphors in capital, he kind of, I don't know how much thought he puts into it, but He's like, you know, your average enlisted soldier and your average worker, your officer and your NCOs and your foreman. Like that's kind of how he scaffolds it. Um, so it'd be, I, I'm really interested in those kind of those ranks, but I'm just less focused on them. Um, yeah, maybe I'll answer one and let other people move, move on. I don't know if I don't want to take up all the question time. We've got lots of time. You can you can finish answering whatever you want. Or if you want to just move on to think more, I will just put it over to Ariana. Like right, I'll just say maybe about the uh, the GI Bill. Um, I think there's a really interesting 20th century story about how, um, like especially in the army, how um, soldiers become like respectable sized, <laughs> um, uh, and a huge part of that is like they have better living conditions. And so they can live more middle-class lives. Um, uh, there's a historian named Jennifer Middlestadt who's done really interesting, um, who did a really interesting book on the, the welfare state of the US army. Um, and a lot of it is about kind of those, those all ideological or cultural dimensions of telling people like you can be a respectable family man and join the army. Um, uh, but um, Less, less something I go into, but um, there's there's definitely really interesting work around that period. Great. Ariana, do you want to respond? <clears throat> hey, that was a really a great question, um, yeah, which is so much food for thought. So um, I suppose I would need more time to think about that, but um, just, um, yeah, just to try and answer, uh, not answer, but some, some thoughts around that. Um, which are not the real answer because yeah, I would need to think more about that. But I, I think um, so. The first thoughts would be um, that yeah, this difference between um, Frederick's idea that assist there is there are met needs and the starting point is a system that is not working, and um, and for Federici, uh, then. Um, the answer is creating autonomous spaces in which social reproduction um, operates. Um, and, and the usefulness um, for me of that perspective is that we, we start thinking about um, autonomous spaces of social reproduction in our cities, um, as well as um, in the different um, locales that Federici talks about, um, which are uh, more, um, uh, which are actually located outside capitalism. Um, for for Heather, um, her so I think it it's more static in a way. Um, Federici's idea, but I think that serves her purpose well in the sense that um, under capitalism, care work and social production is devalued. So we we go to um, we need the answer is creating um, uh, the answer is autonomous spaces. Um, while for for Heller, the idea of capitalism producing constantly new needs and these becoming radical needs only not just by being but by uh, at the moment of their satisfaction, um, kind of projects this into some kind of future. 
um, uh, whether we want to think in terms of a, uh, like an Erdaz, a society of associate producers, um, which is, um, or if you want to try and disperse that um, in a way more similar to Federici's, uh, maybe um, also on a, a smaller scale. So trying to preserve that idea, which is something I would, uh, that I, uh, that was where I was venturing towards the idea of uh, applying Heller's model in a way similar to Federici's um, in relation to autonomous spaces that we may create in social centers or in community um, gardens. Um, so, but, but I suppose that would be a stretch um, because for Heller, really it's thinking in terms of this, of um, social formations, uh, um, in the sense that each social formation has its own structure of needs. So for Heller, when Heller thinks about the society of associated producers, she's really thinking of a different social formation, while, um, while for, for, for me, Federici's model is uh, very helpful because she allows us to think about um, um, those autonomous spaces for social reproduction that we create in the here and now. But this said, the ways in which I was applying Heller, uh, I was using Heller um, framework uh, was in a way, I was kind of blending the two suggesting, let's use, let's think in terms of radical needs, but in relation to autonomous spaces similar to the ones um, that Federici talks about. So definitely there is attention. So, so thanks so much for the question. And, and definitely probably I was applying, I was uh, stretching Heller's framework connecting the mixing with, um, with Federici's, but that was, yeah, so, so um, yeah, so it was definitely a stretch. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for, for, for the question. And I'm sure there are other ways of answering uh, my word just thoughts. Great, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Jamie, would you like to go? Yeah, um, thank you for the questions. Um, yeah, and so I, I like the, the basic question I think is, um, to what extent is this really about artificial intelligence as opposed to other kinds of automation? And I, I think that it actually is pretty clear that it is, um, that artificial intelligence is really what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Because if you just think about the kinds of uh, machines that Marx had available to him and his thinking about this, just, there would be no reason to think that um, that you could have genuine robot labor um, because the, it lacks the kind of um, cognitive uh, capacities that are really um, motivating me to think about this. Um, and then the question is, well, to what extent is it really like likely that, or the case that artificial intelligence can has, have purposes? Um, on one level, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a, a, a computer scientist, um, but I, I am a materialist, and I think that if it's the case that we we kind of are committed to the view that whatever intentions are in humans are kind of some kind of complex material process, then there's no in principle reason to deny that that would be the case that that would be possible on some other kind of substrate. And so, my materialism just kind of like inclines me to the view that even if artificial intelligence isn't uh, currently capable of creating uh, agents that have uh, intentional states and, and purposes. There's no in principle reason why they won't be able to eventually. And so um, I, I think that if you take Marx's materialism seriously, and then you uh, accept his view about uh, labor as being a purposeful activity aimed at the production of use values, then it's just a question of time before we have non-human laborers. And it's an empirical question as to whether or not artificial intelligence is getting us uh, substantially closer to that. I don't see why not. I, I just think that um, the kinds of tasks that artificial intelligence is currently able to solve, um, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking about managerial tasks in particular, where you have an artificial intelligence, which will run the HVAC system for an entire arena, something like that. That sounds to me like labor. That sounds to me like the kinds of activities that um, up until fairly recently were the, the exclusive purview of human beings. And so that's what motivates me to think about this. Um, but even if it's empirically just kind of a, a non-starter that artificial intelligence won't get us there, it's still, I think, an, an, a, a worthwhile set of questions to ask um, for a Marxist. 
Okay. We have um, another question in the chat for Jamie. And then I will also just invite panelists if any of you want to say anything about anyone else's presentations or ask any questions. But so just firstly, if anyone has any more questions, put them in the chat. But Jamie, um, you've been asked, uh, what would this what would be the surplus value generated by the developers, engineers, technicians, etc., who code, build, and maintain the robot? The robot could indeed work for its own reproduction, but doesn't this happen because someone programmed the robot to do so? Um, do you want to just quickly respond to that, and then I'm just going to ask people on the panel if, if, any, if any of you want to ask anyone anything. Yeah, I think that's a really good challenge. I think that one way of resisting the kind of direction that I'm going is just to say that, well, uh, if there is surplus value being extracted from Hopper, it's because of the increased productivity of the uh, programmers that created it, right? And so you just kind of say, oh, whatever seems to be coming out kind of later down the line is actually just because you've, um, the, the productor, the, the, the programmers are the ones that have actually been engaged in, um, in massive increases in their, uh, the productivity of their labor. And I think that, the, that, that there is a, that, that, that's conceptually a viable way to go. Um, I don't think that it is going to be a terribly good way of modeling what's happening if you just kind of insist on that, that there's no way that this can change. Um, and so um, if you had a situation where um, Hopper would go on and for long periods of time be essentially kind of gaining a wage and, and uh, doing work for, um, for a boss, I just don't see how, how, how long you can resist kind of thinking about this on something more, uh, and more analogous to wage labor. Um, but I do think that that's, that's a really viable way of, of resisting this way to go. Um, the only other thing to say, I, I think, is that um, there's a similar problem that you can get into in thinking about how social reproduction goes on too, right? Where you say, well, it's all about um, the, the, the wages and it's all about the, the fact that you've got, um, you have labor that's being, that is productive, that is creating the wages and that's what's really kind of responsible for the, the down the line production. I, I just don't, I, I think that, uh, I don't think that that's a particularly helpful, helpful way of thinking about these issues. Just check if we've got anything. Um, I have a question for Jasmine, if um, if there is time. Yeah, please. So, Jasmine, one of the like the title is about destruction and its relationship to social reproduction. And as you were talking, I was wondering whether or not that is like disentanglable. Because one of the things that struck me is that a lot of the ways in which um, understanding soldiers as being engaged in social reproduction you could just disentangle that from the fact that they're destroying stuff and killing people. Um, and just think of it as like, you know, like imagine that there was like a volunteer corps that was supposed, that was like, you know, going around and planting trees. It might, it might behave and be structured in many of the same ways that, that soldiers um, and barracks are. And it has nothing to do with any kind of destructive activity whatsoever. And so do you think that the, the relationship between soldiers and social reproduction um, is, is, is sort of constrained to certain parts of their activity? Or do you think that, that you want to make sense of the, the, the use of violence um, and um, coercive forces being essentially bound up with um, social reproduction? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think um, for me, I'm coming at it from the perspective of trying to understand um, this, this kind of political um, tension, which is like working class people um, are sent other places to kill other working class people. And this is a political problem for me. Um, uh, and because I'm interested particularly in the militaries of the Imperial Corps, um, I have to kind of look at their their actually their actual function um, in the world system, which is the political and economic domination of uh, the periphery, um, which is you know sometimes sometimes not through the use of force, um, but but kind of 
that's the point of the organization is to be able to produce the course of force and uh, exercise it. Um, so um, I'm not, uh, you could certain like you, like you can have militaries that aren't organized around imperialism um, and aren't capitalist, <laughs> um, but those are the ones that I'm, I'm researching. And I kind of, I think that we should um, not think of, even though militaries have existed kind of across time and space um, for thousands of years in various forms, I think it's less helpful to look at them as a kind of trans-historical category of which like um, capitalist societies have a particular form of it or version of it and more as a, like look at it as something that is a, a, a capitalist, social form or a form that comes out of the capitalist social relation, which is this, this relation of uh, exploitation and, and domination. Um, um, so that's, that's where I'm coming at it from. Um, but certainly there's all kinds of non-destructive activities that, um, a, that a military could do or that um, something very similar in form um, or an organizational form could do. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Can I just follow up with one really brief thing? Just, you know, I know that you, this isn't the direction you want to go, but one thought that I had was that if you actually think about the way that militaries work during um, the kind of the like Roman and Greek uh, period, there's a direct link with social reproduction there, where this was like the way in which that slaves were acquired and that fed into the, the kind of the the labor system. And so I know that it's not, not the direction you want to go, but I do think that there is val valuable questions to think about if you if you go that route as well. Yeah, it's a great point. Thanks. Does, oh, maybe, does anyone else want to ask? Anyone, anyone else? Any other questions? I mean, I think we've got a lot of crossover, but I'm also not going to like arbitrarily start forcing things if people are like, let me leave me alone while. All right, I think looking at YouTube, we have much, and it's half four. So I think on that basis, that's. Uh, oh, I think Ariana has a hand up. Oh, sorry, I didn't even see. Yeah. Oh, the other things. Um, yeah, Ariana, please go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Jasmine and Jamie, for amazing talks. Um, uh, yeah, and the organizers for organizing this. So the question, um, yeah, so it's um, it just, I was thinking, so it was what I really, I enjoyed many things about your papers, but um, uh, of course, what, 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 what's particularly exciting is how you are presenting these agents of social reproduction, which open up uh, totally new ways of thinking, social reproduction, uh, as well as this, um, this category. So I was, so you have hinted a bit, for example, with Hopper, um, you, the starting point for Hopper was that for, in some way he, was, he had become detached for, from his creator. So he was autonomous um, at that point um, on the internet. And, and Jasmine, you were talking about instances of solidarity action um, um, with the Cuban military. Um, so my, so yeah, so I was wondering, um, if if you, well, yeah, which potential you see for um, any kind of um, refusal of work, say, or um, engagement in some form of um, solidarity action based on the social production function of of uh, the military and uh, of. Um, uh, um, artificial intelligence and, and robots. So yeah, so these two issues, whether what 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 can your theory um, tell us about um, the refusal of work uh, within the sphere of social reproduction carried by um, the agents we we're talking about. Um, so I think yeah it's about refusal of work in social production um, from from that perspective and, and and probably there is no time but also whether there is which maybe is connected whether there is any emancipatory potential for 
um, for the development of um, uh, for the for for the use or, or action of these two uh, of the military and of um, artificial intelligence and robots in autonomous space. So whether they can be um, uh, whether there is yeah they can be um, whether they can generate any emancipatory potential where um, operating or placed in autonomous spaces. You can answer either of those two questions. Please. Jasmine, do you want to go first, or? Um, I could, if you do yeah, you need please. more time. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the a lot of the the kind of solidarity action or the kind of radical stuff we see in um, in military settings historically has been in the form of like refusal of work of like military work and like mutinies and and rebellions and things like that. Um, but one came to mind, which is the, the mutiny of the British West Indies Regiment in the First World War in Italy, um, because um, a lot of these soldiers from, um, from the West Indies Regiment were in like kind of the bottom rung of, of work, um, uh, like based on racialization, right? They were made to do kind of the, the cleaning and the, the other things that they thought were, um, like they were, yeah, <laughs> less made the less dignified work as they saw it, um, and obviously it endured a lot of other kinds of um, other experiences of of racism, racism combined with the general hierarchy of a military institution, um, and so their mutiny was partly based on um, being relegated to um, to those more socially reproductive functions rather than combat functions. Um, so there's an interesting story of gender there as well, um, which I want to get into more, but that's kind of, that's the main kind of instance of um, action that was based in, in a social reproductive function directly, um, whereas most of the other cases I've seen have been um, like, like, you know, refusing to shoot and um, <laughs> refusing to man the ship and, and so on. Um, um, in terms of autonomous space and generating emancipatory spaces, um, I'll have to think about that more. But thanks for those questions. Thanks. It was really interesting. Um, so thinking about the the kind of um, the liberatory potential of this stuff, uh, I think it's it's there's a lot of moving parts that need to be kind of sorted out. One one way that um, artificial labor kind of plays into this is the possibility for, um, you know, like uh, the end of work and the possibility of abundance, um, material and otherwise, that would be possible if you had um, some way of supplementing human labor with um, another kind of labor. But on the other side, there's questions about whether or not um, robot labor could be exploited and whether or not that requires moral uh, categories that need to be kind of introduced um and those are just really strange and difficult questions um and because you know the way that i've presented labor is it's essentially about a, a kind of work um and um there's nothing about whether or not labor entails agency and whether or not labor entails that um someone can something can be the target of uh, exploitation understood in a kind of morally loaded way and that all just depends. And if, if it's the case that robots can be exploited, then, then there has to be really pressing problems about whether or not there should be solidarity between human workers and, and robot workers and what that would mean. And it's all very strange and, and, and science fiction. Um, and so I, I haven't really delved into any of that stuff. Um, but I, I do think that the real questions for me are about the way that this could tie into post-capitalist relations of production. And if you have, there's no problem in thinking about robots, robot labor being capable of producing use values. And if you have um, a post-capitalist economy that's focused around the, the, the production of use values, then like this is, this is all good. Um, and so that, that's the, the primary way that I've thought about the, the liberatory potential of, of robot labor, but there are all sorts of very strange and complicated questions that arise once you start thinking about the possibility that robot labor might also coincide with um, moral and political categories that we, we need to track. Okay, thanks, that was great, thanks. 
those are both uh, great answers. I mean, I think, unless again, people really want to come back in, I'd say we are done. Do people, <laughs> do we feel that way? Do we want to have a long conversation? I mean, we're getting towards the end of the session anyway, I think. So, I think that's a can, big can I just ask, can I ask Jasmine a question? Um, just in terms of refusal, I was wondering how you thought about um, draft resisting as being part of a kind of refusal. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the Vietnam War, it seems like a long time ago now, but is that, how, how do you think about that kind of moment where before the advent of, um, at least in the United States and in Canada, volunteer forces, um, draft resisting kind of was, was part of how the, the, the refusal uh, might, might function? Yeah, I mean, I think it's good, <laughs> and people should people should do it. People should res resist the draft. Um, yeah, I think what the I think it speaks to the. There's lots of interesting questions yeah. that the advent of a volunteer force brings up, um, and like how we how we conceive of soldiers or veterans or conscripts um, as a part of the labor movement of um, like working class or, or socialist or communist movements generally. Um, but um, I think the kind of that historical development, um, it kind of, it changes a lot of um, kind of the intuitive calculus, right? Like we have like more, more sympathy for people who are forced um, uh, into military service than people who who volunteer for it, um, but also I think as like as good um, as as like good socialists, we should understand that like the idea of choice is not a straightforward thing. Um, um, but also, people can have political principles, um, so it's I think it's complicated. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if I have much more to say on that. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm going to say thanks to everyone. Great presentations, great questions. I think that was a really good conversation. And I think we've uh, had a very good session today. Um, and I think, yeah, that's to say then, congratulations to everyone. Thank you. And I think we'll call it a day for that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thanks, Thank Rob. You.